Welcome everyone. I'm Noelle Marshall with the Co-Creators Convergence and welcome to the our Creator Convos, which we hold every Thursday night. And I want to tell you, we have a very, very special evening. And um, we have a guest, uh, Mari Fix McEwen, and uh, she is an Indigenous elder, a grandmother. We'll learn more about her later. Uh, but she is brought, we're going to be in ceremony all evening. So we have ceremonialists with us that she will introduce here shortly. But before we begin, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Co-Creators Convergence, and then we shall begin our evening together. So stand by. everyone for joining us tonight and I have um, I'm going to introduce our guests here shortly and um, I'm going to bring them up. So our guest Mari Fix McEwen and she will be introduced tonight by someone else who was a guest on a previous CCC call, Patricia Ann Davis. And Patricia is going to welcome Mari and Mari is going to lead us. You know, I'm just going to ask you all to Please keep your video off and stay muted. You may put your comments and questions in the chat. And uh, if there's time at the end, Mari will, will, will bring those in. And um, I think that's about it for right now. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you now, uh, Patricia and, and Mari. Greetings, everyone. A warm heart-to-heart -heart hug. I'm so pleased and honored to introduce Mari Fix McEwen. Now, I don't know where to start because she has an extensive bio. I'm going to ask her to um, introduce herself through her own lineage, but I would like to say these things that I know about her, that she is the founder of the Ancestors of the Four Directions, and a sitting grandmother and elder with the Four Winds Europe. And I have been so um, blessed to, to have participated in this, these events. She is a ceremonialist, a minister, an alternative medicine practitioner, also serves as a medical intuitive and apprentice to Dr. Daniel Rebus for 10 years and has facilitated therapeutic sound journeys since 1991. She holds a certificate in art therapy and also sound healing, Celtic studies, ancient architecture and archeology. span And she has served as a teacher and agile college professor. She is a sitting grandmother and a circle co-facilitator with the indigenous grandmothers of Europe. She supports women of European ancestry to revive their roots, to embrace their indigenous values, and to unify with other indigenous relatives to create healing, understanding, solidarity, balance, and connection. As the founder of the Ancestors of the Four Directions, 
She is a member of Chief Phil Lane's Four Worlds International Teoshbe Clan and Chief Reuben George Four Worlds Women's Talking Circle. Also the Order of Bards, Ovedas and Druids in the UK. She is a facilitator and thank you, Mari. She's um, acknowledging um, myself as a Choctaw, Navajo, Chata, the elder of the indigenous change, the indigenous ceremony change process that is dedicated to understanding what is out of balance and to identify root causes and change them for people um, personally and also as we do that for all humanity and the good of all. Welcome, let's welcome Mary Fix McEwen. Thank you so much, Patricia. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lessons of the Scottish Wildcat. Here we're going to be uncovering delusion, finding clarity, and exploring taking appropriate action in your life, moving from realization and indigenous knowledge. My name is Mari Fix McEwen, or Sainetta Bofouche Koya Ventus, from lineage Clan Ewing of Kilfinnan Alaba, or Scotland. Let us now open this evening with purification and ceremony. And I pass to the center. Creator, grandmothers, grandfathers, this is your granddaughter, we Chunkpi, we Akpakpa, we are speaking. Welcoming all here now from the four directions into the sacred circle. We cleanse and purify this space in a good way with the clearing power of the cedar medicine and the gentleness of the sage. As the earth and fire join each other and transmute themselves, invite these healing medicines to completely wash over your body, your mind, and your spirit. Bathing every thought, every word, and every deed brought into this sacred space and beyond as we explore the deep topics at hand. Visualize this feather brushing away and clearing off anything heavy and outmoded that you've carried with you and anything that you no longer wish to hold on to. Release it all, bless it all in a kind and gentle way. May you all feel lighter, brighter, and clear to communicate in this purified sacred circle of intention and creation. All my relations, I pass to the center. All my relations. Great spirit, this is your granddaughter, Cynthia. Clat Cunningham of Clan Cunningham of Ireland. I call in Erher, place of new beginnings, inspiration, illumination. May there be peace in the East. I call in Jeshkart, in the place of vitality, the place of the life force. May there be peace in the South. I call in Yarker, in the place of cleansing, releasing, and healing. May there be peace in the West. And I call in Tuskyart, in the place of grounding, stability, May there be peace in the north. I now call in Nuivre, Father Son, source of all life force and the solar force. And I call in Mother Earth, who births us and holds us so sweetly and gives us stability. And I also call in the divine within, 
the place of the voice of our ancestors, where we are one with the web of life. I pass to the center. And now I speak a Druid prayer in Gaelic or Irish for those non-Americans. To Duina al Spiridu who sent Agassi Gusant Niert Agassi Niert Tishant Agassi Tishant Ulus Agassin Ulus Ulus and Kiert Agassin Ulus and Kiert on Grahe Agassin Grafwe on Grado na Buher Fad Agus in grado na buher fwad an grado ola spirit. Agus gach mahas awanin lesh. And I pass to the center. Creator, this is your granddaughter, Alexandra Lorraine Bidianta, from the Ligurian land in Europe, between France and Italy. I will speak the Druid prayer in English for all our guests. <sighs> Grant us, O Spirit, thy protection, and in protection, strength, and in strength, understanding, and in understanding, the knowledge, and in knowledge, the knowledge of justice, and in the knowledge of justice, the love of it, and in that love, the love of all existence and in the love of all existence, the love of spirit, spirit and all goodness. And I pass the feather in the center. Justice is to align and make congruent, to put our lives back into order and proper balance. I now call to the principles of harmony and congruence bringing these forward within our awareness. May each of us be aligned with our own true nature in right relationship with Mother Earth, Father Sky, and the breath of life itself. May each of us realize our connection to the absolute and take off any blinders that delude us for the sake of the planet, our true fulfillment, and all the coming generations. I now put these prayers into the fire as we begin. I would like to start this evening out with a quote from Barbara Marks Hubbard. The great human problem of evil stems from our illusion of separateness. Whenever this illusion is overcome, we behave lovingly to one another. It's a fundamental truth in enlightenment circles and in indigenous knowledge that we live in interdependence we are not separate from life itself. And we cannot escape living in that relationship, no matter how hard we try. Enlightened or self-realized teachers speak of the oneness with all. Indigenous wisdom speaks of the caretakership of the earth, living within the cycles and all my relations. This is not a concept Rather, it is a living, breathing reality. But on a lot of levels, we cling to the false belief that we are separate because many of us don't feel this oneness. We might believe in the idea of oneness, but it remains conceptual in our mind. We sure talk about it a lot 
but we rarely experience it, if ever, let alone live the reality of it. Maybe we've had a fleeting transcendent experience or a glimpse into the nature of quote reality through meditation, psychedelics, or just having it come upon us by the grace of the universe. And those experiences are something that you will never forget completely. But then the amnesia often sinks in. Here on earth in the Western world paradigm, we have been taught that we are separate from life and we think and feel that we are separate. So even if oneness and interdependence are the truth of the universe on the ultimate level, when we say we are all one, a part of us feels like it's lying because it has no awareness of that fact. Living in the awareness of separation we feel that reality is what our mind thinks it is. When you feel separate or experience yourself as a separate being, then you feel that something fundamental is missing in your life. So you look to the world to fill the gap. That's where materialism comes in and constant striving. But actually, there is no such thing as separation. It is an illusion, just as an idea in your mind. Is what you think the truth is the entire picture? Is what your mind says really happening in reality? How can someone have one idea of reality, my reality, and another person have a different idea? Is that really reality? No. Not in my book, it's not reality. It's perception that is relative. What if you woke up one day and saw that you had made it all up? That you as a separate being did not exist at all? Well, that's what happened to me. It's called self-realization. In a moment of realization, I saw that the myth of me was not real and that everything that was concocted in the mind was not reality. What would you say if I told you that all of that head chatter was not true? That what you think is your life and what you think in your mind is actually not real. That who you think you are or the story of me is not the actuality of your being. Well, once you see that, you can't unsee it. And then you hopefully embody that in your being and go out and spread the news. That's what all these enlightened realized teachers are doing, attempting to get you to embrace your true relationship with all that is, your oneness with the universe, your emptiness inside, not from the mind, but from your being. Jesus supposedly said, I and the Father are one, which translates to, I and the totality are one. Basically, if you were having the experience of oneness with the universe, you are not going to hurt yourself or anything else in any way. And since yourself is synonymous with the whole, you aren't going to go out and hurt anything. Getting back to indigenous knowledge, if we are one with the whole of life, then what we do reverberates throughout life. But most are unaware of this because of our upbringing. Even if we have bought into the idea of oneness, we live a life that allows us to justify doing anything we want while ignoring the fact that our actions affect the whole. I remember J. Krishnamurti saying that there is no choice in life, really, because when you are aligned with what is real, you always do what is appropriate. Now, that kind of alignment is one of being. 
basically in that there is no free will. It's actually merging your free will with the divine's will. Letting go of what you feel separates you from the source, the universe, and the whole of life. Uniting with your true nature. Free will is really actually leaving your nature. Whereas alignment is what people call self-realization, where the mind ceases to confuse your perceptions. Because it's the mind that tells you all sorts of things like, I'm ugly, I'm stupid, I'm better than you, I am entitled, I'm superior, you are dumb, you are not human, you are the devil, you are not civilized, it's okay to steal and kill and deceive, and it's okay to have lords and serfs and slavery if you can get away with it. It's not okay for you to have massive wealth while others die around you in squalor if you're in alignment. The mind goes on and on with its ideas and its schemes, its justifications, its agendas, and its plans. A mind that is not aligned with the truth creates all sorts of problems. And those problems are the ones we are faced with now. Even great altruistic plans from the mind can be misguided, like creating green energy devices that wreak havoc on the planet because they are not sustainable. Michael Moore pointed this out in his latest movie, A Planet of Humans, a highly unpopular look at the lack of sustainability in the green movement. Now we can argue back and forth about whether his whole movie was completely accurate or not. However, the point here is, do we as a species really know what we're doing? After all, who wants to acknowledge that what we are doing to save the earth may be creating more good than harm? It's not pleasant to look at. Because any good exploration starts with reflection. Let's take you more into the mind and the nature of the mind and how we got into this situation we find ourselves in. Would one that truly believed they were interrelated and interwoven into the whole of the fabric of life desecrate this life or put itself above another aspect of the life? Feel into that for a second. Is it the mind that creates the illusion of separateness? You're taught that this is you and someone else's other. That is the main belief system here, isn't it? It's all about knowledge. Knowledge in this frame needs to have something to know. So there is a perceived separation between subject and object. Subject is perceived to be different than object. Subject doesn't feel one with object or even interrelated. That's how we can pollute the lakes and the air, how we can perpetrate on others, taking their land, enslaving them, selling out life with cap to capitalism and greed, amassing mountains of wealth while others go hungry. Because subject doesn't feel like it's one with the object and subject does not feel interdependent or related to object, Subject perceives themselves as separate and has been told they are separate from birth. Also, when you work in the domain of the mind, the mind stays within its own track so you don't change dynamics. It just keeps in the same old groove rehashing things. Information in, think about it, Look for information that supports what you think the world is already. Make a stronger case for what you believe. The mind always operates from the past and not the present because thought 
is either running around in the same groove of what happened before, or it is projecting fake scenarios into the future based on what it already expects or hopes for. But it never goes into the domain of the miraculous, the new, the transcendent, the present. The mind may imagine those scenarios as concepts, but are those real changes or just passing ideas? The mind just runs on like a tape loop, more of the same. Some may look upon the mind as positive in the cases where we've had a horrible experience in the past that we're wanting to protect ourselves from. But the mind only projects its fears into the future and makes possible outcomes. The mind says, this happened and it may be happening again, so I need to protect myself from it. It is only direct communication with the divine that is the only accurate knowing. So what do we do in this world? We spend our time amassing opinions and ideas about what life is. We don't even live much anymore. But just look at, ev look at everything up on the internet to learn about it facts, ideas. We memorize them, believing we understand life. Remember when you used to catch polywogs in the water and watch them become frogs or watch butterflies hatch from a cocoon? Or maybe you never did that. Well, if you haven't, you're missing out. Is this the same as reading about it on the internet? When you're watching life, participating in life, you are immersed in the mystery of it. Isn't that so? Memorizing information. Does it create the, the illusion that we have it all figured out? Is that really education? Could you conceptualize the magic of life solely in the mind? Eckhart Tolle says, words reduce reality to something the human mind can grasp, which isn't very much. Do you believe this could explain who you are or the ultimate purpose of the universe or even what a tree or stone in its depth is? Is all the analysis you are creating inside actually happening? Or is it just a projection? A projection about what others are thinking or doing or what is really happening? How can people have such different perceptions of reality? No, these ideas are not reality. They are phenomenal perception. Then with these ideas, we argue about them on the internet. We try to prove who's right and wrong, why the other is just plain stupid or misguided, and we get a sense of superiority from it, don't we? We think we really get it and have it together. But inside, there is this gaping hole. That's how racism happens, isn't it? You want to believe that someone is lower species, or you want to believe some person's words that were written in a book, or even crazier believe someone's interpretation of someone's words in a book. It allows you to justify your opinions and behaviors. It allows you to steal someone's land or think they are a baboon or put them in a concentration camp or to work them until they drop on a railroad or plantation or go along with the agenda of someone else because you are in fear or you want to gain power from associating with them. Or 
you may use it to feel certainty in life. It allows you to torture, kill, maim, or disfigure. It allows you to imprison or banish. Because the mind is king and the mind thinks all sorts of things and it can come up with all sorts of distortions. Did you once question those cherished beliefs handed down from your family or your peer group or someone else's interpretation of a book? Or did you find yourself wanting to join the club, fit in and be loved? Because we all want to be loved. Did you ever question your supposed separation with the universe? Well, if you haven't, you're not alone. If you, if you have done all this, you're not alone. As we are taught and conditioned to go along with what we are given as a belief system and seldom look any further. Lately, I find that critical race theory, there is an argument going on in there. We have to hide the true history or the ugly truth would be revealed. We have to hide our feelings and put up slogans. So some children have to live on the brunt end of racism while the rest are shielded and spared from knowing what is going on to quote, maintain their innocence. Like one group of children is entitled to innocence and the other one is not. We never see that perhaps it is more about keeping the game going and the players unexposed. Sri Muji says, Love is not selective, just as the light of the sun is not selective. It does not make one person or group special. It is not exclusive. Exclusivity is not the love of God, but the love of ego. And so this world is created based on the mind, thievery, and controlling narratives. We make nuclear weapons to protect us from other people in the mind. We steal land and then put up borders saying, don't take the land we just stole. Did we question originally stealing the land? Now it's ours in our country. Now someone sells you the land they have stolen. Their family has amassed a lot of wealth from all that thievery over the years. They had the most guns or they could buy people to do their bidding. Now you are buying the stolen land and are enslaved to a mortgage that is extracting more fees by banking families that have stolen land and labor. And if you don't comply with living this way, you're out on your ear. Those people have spent a lot of time telling us we can have the American dream if we just do this and this. And they also have spent time convincing us that we want that dream. And we have bought into it. You say, well, all that happened a long time ago and we have to live with it now. That that was then, that this is now. What has happened has happened. Get over it. But isn't it still happening? Maybe we don't like things, so we protest. But then the government comes in and moves against the people, the very people that they are supposedly representing, all for the sake of maintaining the power structure of the status quo. We were either a perpetrator taking the land a victim or a compliant perpetrator going along with all of this. And the energy continues in capitalism. The top dog wins. Amass as much as you can and don't share it. 
every man and woman for themselves. And we will wave to you as you sink into the pit if anything happens to you. Are you not exhausted and tired of living this way? Is this your idea of life? Is this the dream you held as an innocent child of what life could be? So you think, I will just work harder and get ahead. I will take a workshop or a master class and become a master something or other in a week or a weekend and then advertise myself as such and compete against the throngs by learning to use the advertising funnels. Even though you know that it's a lie because no one is a master in a weekend or even 10 years. I will take a workshop with one of those self-help gurus that allows me to make a million dollars because I don't know how to change this system. And someone said, you can have it all if you just work for it. Have what? The stress, the game, the story, the fear, the lion's share. Joining in with the mass delusion, feeding the problem. The enlightened teacher Krishnamurti said, it is no measure of health to adapt to a sick society. And he goes on. All of us have been trained by education and environment to seek personal gain and security and to fight for ourselves. Though we cover it over with pleasant phrases, we have been educated for various professions within a system which is based on exploitation and acquisitive fear. And because of this, we are desperate to be someone, to be recognized, to make a living, to take care of our children. So we acquiesce, accept, agree, or give consent by keeping silent or by not making objections to this madness. And it keeps us busy running around in circles. We learn to get by to compromise that which should not be compromised. And in this society, everything is compromised and taken, isn't it? Because it started that way. It continues. It is per perpetuating the myth of separation and acquisition. Manifest destiny. The doctrine of discovery. Rape and pillage. You wouldn't act that way to yourself nor to your relations if you felt the interdependence and love of the universe in harmony. So we want to be something or someone to make a living. And we keep up that perpetrator energy. We don't mean to. We steal ideas and concepts from other people and take it for our own. We parrot each other's knowledge and ideas without having lived it or discovered it ourselves. So our words have no power. We mimic and repeat the storyline, the belief systems others are selling. I know this isn't, all of it isn't easy to hear. <laughs> we steal words from other cultures, like shaman. And then we deem ourselves one of them because we project that what they do, we do. Did we ever ask a shaman from Mongolia if we were truly a shaman? Just because we do drum journeys or other aspects of what they may do. When we take their words, then their words no longer have meaning 
and it is a big free-for-all. Words stop having meanings because we co-opt them. We also try to associate ourselves with their words because that word has power and meaning. And we want to be associated with power and meaning. That is one of the reasons why the native peoples here are so upset with the Westerners or colonizers. Not only did we forbid them from being Indian by Christianizing them and told them they were of the devil but we made illegal their ceremonies and their language, killed them and buried them under religious boarding schools. And then we tried to be a shaman, a medicine man, wear their headdresses and take their names for our football teams. We decided to capitalize on the very thing that gave them power. When does this madness stop? Do we really understand others? Or have we merely been assuming things that we really have no idea about? Frankly, I don't know many black people that will speak honestly with white people. I keep hearing that it is too much of a bother because white people just want them to get over it. Things like slavery and racism and trauma pretending like these things really have gone away. Trivializing or not understanding the actual meaning or depth of white privilege. You have equality now, so why are you complaining? Have we ever asked others what they are really going through and really from the bottom of our heart wanted to hear it? the good, the bad, and the ugly. Are we willing to do that? How far are we willing to go to heal? Or are we just going to keep holding on to our beloved cherished ideas of reality? You may say at this point, well, a lot of people here are not that way and I'm not really. Well, I would challenge each of us to look deeply at ourselves. You also may be saying inside, Mari, you are just being negative and creating negativity by pointing all of this out. The emperor has no clothes, people. Seeing the truth of how the mind works is not being negative. It's gaining clarity. Being negative is being at the effect of a runaway mind and its runaway world. So what does that all have to do with the Scottish wild cat, you may ask? The subject of our lecture. The Scottish wild cat the cat of the woodlands or the forest cat is an icon of the Scottish wilderness. A mysterious and elusive creature. It is one of the largest remaining mammals in Scotland. The wild cat is more than the symbol of our primordial and original wild nature as the emblem of the Pictish clans. The Picts are a people speculated to be the original indigenous of Alba or Scotland. Historically, Cathanus region was known as the land of the cats. The chief of the clan Sutherland is known as the great man of the cats. There is a cat on the crest and their motto is sans peur, without fear. If you look at a close-up of a wild cat's face, fearsome and furious, fangs barred and yellow eyes narrowed. They will fight for their freedom with the passion we can only dream of. 
Hunters with a bold and fiery spirit, they are considered to be the most untamable animal known. No one has ever been able to tame a Scottish wildcat, even if raised from a kitten, for they are a truly wild cat. Far back in the history of Scotland, the earliest peoples told legends about wild cats so fierce that they bested human companions, who worshiped them as forest spirits. Centuries later, Clans formed together under the banner of the wild cat and fought wars for the independence of the land against would-be colonizers. Often referred to as the tiger of the highlands, striking, handsome, and powerful, they are the very essence of a wild predator living by strength and stealth. Now, Scotland doesn't possess very many species that are unique to her land. The Scottish wildcat is the very essence of our national heritage. Wildcats live solitary lives with overlapping territories. In that way, they live in harmony with the ecosystem. They don't overpopulate. They don't produce big burden on the prey species. They only breed once a year and they've evolved to live in the wildest of places, the highlands. They're considered a species on their own because they have spent two million years in isolation. However, what I haven't told you yet is the most important part. There's only about 35 purebred Scottish wildcats in existence, if that. They're critically endangered. The Scottish wildcat is so endangered, it's not only considered one of the rarest animals in Britain, but is only the only surviving member of the cat family in Britain. Scottish wildcats like lynxes and wolves are apex predators. So what does that mean? It means they're at the top of the food chain. When a predator is at the top of the food chain, their presence there is what keeps the balance of nature intact. I know some of you know this already, but I'm going to just mention it for another little bit. Scientists have found that if wolves, an apex predator, are killed off in the ecosystem, that the whole ecosystem goes out of whack. The deer start overpopulating, and then all the trees get stripped, and then the grasses get overgrazed, and then the land turns desolate and the streams start drying up and it becomes a wasteland. If you are going to save an apex predator species, the big cats and wolves are at the top. If you don't have the apex species preserved, the chain gets broken and it makes conservation pretty much impossible. Rewilding serves to bring apex predators back. In fact, they've found that spirit knows best and that all the animals and the plants that lived there need to be there for the balance and harmony of life. So ultimately to rewild is to bring life back into an area. So what caused this beloved cat of the highlands to almost completely disappear? Like many other creatures, man has hunted them to extinction, as well as trapped them for trying to, um, as they're trying to protect sheep and other farm animals sold for profit. Sheep herders and ranchers have been the biggest opposition to rewilding, as they often argue that bringing apex predators back to Scotland will cut their profits. Facts and data, however, support that reintroducing apex predators back into the landscape like the wildcat will put the land back in balance. But many bemoan the speculation they will lose a sheep or two, concerned with each penny rather than overall health of the system. But wildcats and larger predators are proven to kill less than four sheep a year per estate. 
The other biggest threat to the wildcat is hybridization. Because there are so few wildcats and there are so few mate selections for them, people's ho house cats have gone out roaming in the highlands and have been inter interbreeding with the cats. This creates feral cats roaming and distilling the purity of the species. Conservations have conducted ongoing spay and neuter programs to stop interbreeding of house cats with their wilder counterparts. Like any animal, wild cats live by an instinct, basically their original divine blueprint, and they do not stray from their original nature. What is the difference with humans? We're not functioning in interdependence with all of nature. We think we're separate and we can do anything we please. We put our individual ideas of want and fear first, even if it means suicide for the planet and each other. How can we claim to be the pillar of superiority intelligence that we think we are? if we're killing ourselves and all of life. It's a mind in separation that is solely concerned with all about me. In the age of instinct, ice sheets made way for dense forests, mapped by the silence of acute senses uncut, no life was felled. In the time before wild, before reason, before definition, the present and heart beating, leading. A hunter man, silent and crouching between the ancient oaks, Ten thousands of years of uncarved, unhampered, unparalleled, untamed. Wildcat, one with the forest, the prey, the predator, the balance upheld in a stalking dance. Maintained where life begets life all equally held, timeless, suspending each other. But the new neighbors have moved in. A new breed of man who has lost his senses. The myth tellers among them have been believed. They say, over multiply and be fruitful. Grasp what you can. The mind has laid conquest to the land for the taking. It muses that it has dominance and attacks for power. In a gold lust, it entertains that it is king. It cites and writes books that are upholding, upholding its agenda pronounces its intentions of conquest as free will. It takes up the battle cry and descends upon the harmonious, intertwined wildness, ripping it from its delicate equilibrium. It asserts a false authority. The most violent, fearful, and ambitious among them seize control and subjugate. With the highland clearances displacing the rest. Insisting on their superiority and subduing our culpability by tales that lull us into inaction. Powerlessness, sleep, and slavery. They say, they are our public servants, but when we object, they move against us to secure their position as masters. The wild cat falls under this harvesting for furs of status. 
She is not written into their lists of inclusion. She is tolerated only when she asks for nothing and takes nothing. Like the ones who are now called serfs among lords. Those who have fallen through the cracks or the working stiff. But as this is impossible for her, she is hunted down and made sport of. Encroachers shove her into smaller spaces. Her life is regulated to their use. While drying rivers mourn wolves and deers number in the tens of thousands stripping the vegetation. The weary join the ranks and cooperate. Saying that is then, this is now. That the damage has already begun. Swept along by the waves of momentum. We rarely imagine we could change things for the better, stop, or slow down. We don't question the definition of progress handed down to us. Impotent, we move to prayer and talk as an only form of action. The weight of the fallout is beyond belief and keeps us staring at the program on TV while blankly we continue to consume their message. We wait for someone to save us or regulate a cure. The mind, the virus is upon us and we ought to close our eyes and get back to business as usual. Now we look at the wild cat and what we have lost in ourselves. The cat becomes a banner under which we raise our voices to acknowledge the loss of our wildness, our connection with spirit and our balance with all of nature. Something we have lost touch with. What part of us is going along with a life that is not in harmony? allowing ourselves to hybridize with the status quo, to take in the ways that are against our spirit and our sensibilities. Is there anything left of our original nature? How can we rewild ourselves, live in right relationship, feeling the connection of all life? rather than being in the mind and acquiescing to our own individual fears and needs, courting suicide. We are a species in danger of losing our basic life support system. A significant portion of the Earth's population will soon recognize, says Eckhart Tolle, if they haven't already done so that humanity is now faced with a stark choice. Evolve or die. As our lives have become tamer and more predictable, could our feline relatives bring to our attention something we have missed? This speaks of a deep sense of loss and a longing for something intangible, mysterious, and echoes to something we innately know inside, yet have rarely experienced or ever experienced. Like enlightenment. Enlightenment is our very nature. Interdependence is our very nature. We cannot be separated from it. We always live in relationship to the whole. We can't, we can pretend we don't, but we always do. We just have no awareness of it. 
And is, it is this lack of awareness that moves us into the mind and into disharmony. But just because we have not experienced this oneness doesn't mean that it is completely and wholly out of our reach. Scottish wildcat is an emblem and a real life example of our primordial nature a totem of our original being before it lost its way. The apex predator that brings balance. Man is known as an apex predator too, but does he create balance by creating Chernobyl, Fukushima and the likes? Does he have to balance nature by killing himself off so that nature can go on unencumbered? This is not a true apex predator. Who am I? What is my original nature? How can I live in the awareness of my oneness with all? Not as an idea in the mind, but as being itself. Eckhart Tolle says the single most vital step in your journey towards enlightenment is this. Learn to disidentify with the mind. He goes on to say, not to be able to stop thinking is a dreadful affliction. But we don't realize this because almost everyone is suffering from it. So it is considered normal. This incessant mental noise presents you from finding that realm of inner stillness that is inseparable from your being. Are we going to keep breeding with domesticated cats and going along with the program? Are we willing to look at the situation of this world directly in the eyes and not hide from it and to tell the truth about it? <clears throat> Aren't we all exhausted? We're no longer aware of our primordial nature. We've accepted the life that's been handed to us, a life where everything is compromised. Or is it just that we don't want to give up this lifestyle even if it takes us to disaster? Are we willing to be responsible and make the decisions that are congruent with all of nature? Often we kid ourselves, thinking that all these new inventions are needed, or even superior to a simpler way. Do you know that the aboriginals report that they can read each other's minds? Because they had nothing to hide. Do cell phones help us develop our capabilities? Or are we actually crippling our abilities with these things? What did we do before cell phones? And now we just, we just had 3G. Do we actually need 4G, 5G, 6G, and so on? Do we need more and more and more and faster games and faster phones and the metaverse and virtual reality to distract us so we can live in a self-created matrix? Do we need endless entertainment and the novel? Or do we need to open up to the actual magic of life by penetrating to the core of reality? Jesus turned over the tables on the money traders. Being a truth teller is not always easy business. Reclaim the ability to not tolerate what is off. Stop waiting for a politician, a minister, or philosopher to fix it. If they were going to fix it, it would have been done a long time ago. And when we wait for them to do that, we're obviously confused. Just because their mind ideas matched yours in some way, they are beholden to others that are not concerned with such things. In indigenous ways, true rulership is to be responsible for the whole of nature 
and be congruent with the source, not to have your group's way with the world. King Arthur was supposedly supposed to be Arthur as God King, aligned with God. Celtic kings were beholden to the land and all the people, or they were removed. Obviously, we simply haven't known who to follow or what to do to get in touch with our nature or what is real. So we just sit around talking, figuring we will be leaders ourselves, making podcasts or a movement, expounding ideas in the mind. We, have, we are the ones we have been waiting for is somewhat of a fallacy. It may be true on one level, but until we are aligned with the truth of our very nature, we cannot lead ourselves out of illusion. The first thing is to be honest with ourselves and not just point at others. Natives have been living for thousands of years in caretakership. And look what has happened in the last few hundred. When caretakership is gone by the wayside. Martin Luther King said one of the surest signs of maturity is the ability to rise to the point of self-criticism. Yes, the strongest thing we can really do is admit the truth. That the mind doesn't have a clue as to what it's doing. The mind can't get you into oneness with the absolute or it would have a long time ago. Muji says, attempting to understand consciousness with your mind is like trying to illuminate the sun with a candle. It is not your mind that will take you into harmony. It is your nature and the discovery of it within you. What is that saying? You can't solve the problem on the level of the problem. Or you can't solve the problem on the level of the mind. <clears throat> Where are the wise now? The blind are leading the blind. The indigenous had grandmother councils that were in touch with the divine and led the people. That was a full-time job for them, and most of them were trained from infancy. Now, just because you're older or intuitive, I'm not saying to declare yourself an elder and step up. Don't try to be something you're not ready for, or be anything for that matter. Be nobody and see if you lose anything but delusion says Muji. Even, even having kundalini experiences or various phenomenal happenings are not the final destination. They may be a signpost that you're shifting in some way, but as Muji says, they are child's play when it comes to the actuality of the divine and connection that is possible. Are you wholly and completely in awareness of your oneness with the divine? Source and source alone chooses elders and shamans and medicine people. If you are one, you will be recognized and trained as such. You don't need to worry about it. If it's real, you won't be able to escape it. Self-proclaiming or wondering if you are one is the trap of the ego. What I'm saying is you may want to look into finding the whys and lead, that lead you out of the delusion of separation. The enlightened ones that have eliminated the separation within. Those that live from the true model of being and interdependence. I would suggest to follow and look within until you know so you can remember who you actually are.
then you will lead with clarity from an entirely different place energetically. In fact, you will feel it in your whole being. Seek freedom, your true nature within, not as a concept. Be ye like me and you too shall do greater. Be ye like me. Muji says the final bridge to cross is to let go of the mind created spiritual self. Burn that bridge behind you. Stay empty of self image or spiritual ego and cease looking. It is the universe itself that will truly lead you to who you are. Surrendering your will to the divine is purification. You are not going to be handed the keys unless you are pure, because if you could create anything instantly, you would be opening Pandora's box without that purification. So the mind needs to be quieted. Be honest, see the truth. It takes a good dose of humility to admit not knowing. Ask for help from the divine and seek within. Who am I really? And with a thimble full of humor, if I catch anyone giving this lecture without being in the space of authenticity, an inner realization. You will be in violation of parroting. Speak from your own inner knowing or always quote others. Wildcats are fierce and will defend life itself above all else. They don't go out without a fight. They are apex predators and responsible for life in balance. They don't get confused about their real nature. Sans peur, without fear. Do it for the sake of your authenticity and all of life. The rest is for other explorations. Lastly, I would like to share with you two of the organizations that I have founded. The first organization is called Ancestors of the Four Directions. This is a group of indigenous elders and representatives from all colors and nations that address the imbalances and transgressions that have occurred on the planet with an eye towards healing and reclaiming our alignment with nature and each other. The second group is an organization for European or displaced European lineage people to explore their roots and realign with nature and their original blueprint. Here we will also take a deep look at history and the nature of earthways. We have also have an upcoming three or four part workshop that doesn't have a date yet that is being developed that will start to bridge the transgressions between African American community and the European peoples. All are welcome. These workshops will ask the hard questions and seek to create honesty, understanding and illumination into the history and current problems at hand with an eye towards deep regenerative healing. We seem to be getting close to the end of our scheduled time. So we will drop links into the chat where you can sign up for our email list and give an energy exchange donation for any benefit that you may have received here today. You can also help us by supporting us there. We would love to have you join us in our Ancestors of the Four Directions upcoming programs. 
and endeavors dedicated to healing the divide between races and deepening and reviving our indigenous roots. As we look to create more clarity, compassion, understanding, and heart-to-heart -heart connection with others, the natural world, and our own inner knowing. We will also be exploring how to work together to change this world and create projects that work within these principles together. Because together, we can do this. Thank you for joining us this evening. And especially thanking Patricia and Noel and Bob Marshall Warner of the Co-Creators Convergence for their platform and support. I'm not sure if we have another Thank time. you, thank you, Mari, for that transmission. Yes, we have a prayer that we're gonna do out. Okay. Should we do that now? Yeah, um, I think so. And we do have at least one question from Patricia Ann Davis. I don't know if you want to do that before or after the prayer. Um, I can look at it real quick. Okay, I'm going to put it in the chat. It just uh, says, what were the highlights of the messages of the elder grandmothers who spoke at the Zoom event? At the witch dance? Uh, let's see, I'm going to see. I'm going to ask uh, Patricia to unmute. And so she may be able to. Um, yeah. Uh, it was the one, Ancestors of the Four Directions. Oh, um, the highlights? Uh, the highlights were, first of all, uh, Patricia was talking about uh, the indigenous change process and um, how to remediate the way we are doing things, how to relook at how we are doing things, and how to start the process of purifying ourselves in the mind and heart so we may move into being in balance and harmony. Um, one of the other grandmothers, Tahira, was speaking of, uh, she is an African descent and also indigenous, as far as indigenous native descent. And she was speaking of her grandmother and what she learned from her as an African American and how to take a situation that was ab, ab, or apparent, basically, or not in harmony, and how to transmute that and bring it back into harmony. So when we get back to the ancestors of the four directions, and if you get on the mailing list, we will be having more events where these grandmothers can come and speak and give their intuition that has been received from source, mm. but also um, the ways they have learned on how to keep everything in caretakership and congruence. So I would say that would be, thank you for the question. Wonderful. Uh, Mari, would it be okay if I invite everyone to turn on their video while you do your final prayer? So they Absolutely. can send. Absolutely. Yes. So I invite everyone to, this has just been such a remarkable, beautiful evening. I just um, invite everyone to turn on your video to join us as, uh, sorry, taking my breath away to close us out with a beautiful prayer. Thank you. Uh, putting all your heart prayers into this prayer also. So please pray, pray from your heart. Mm -hmm. Now in prayer, all of us together. May each moment made in correction as we align more to our original being become a pole star to guide us to awakening and right action. May we cleave to our true nature beyond thought and feel the universe pulsing through our lives, guiding us home. For with this alignment, 
and connection comes actual peace. And I pass to the center to Alex. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, grandmother. I rise each day. We all rise each day through the strength of the heavens, through the light of the sun, the brilliance of the moon, the splendor of the fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of the wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, and the strength of the rocks arise each day. We rise each day, and we give thanks each day. I'll pass the feather in the center. I thank and honor the four directions for their presence here today. May there be peace in the four quadrants. And I thank and honor Father, Son, Mother Earth, and the divine within. May there be peace in all three realms and within each and every one of us. I pass to the center. Thanking and blessing all that join the sacred circle from the four directions. We cleanse and purify ourselves in a good way as we close this circle, washing ourselves fully and completely with these medicines, bathing every corner of our energetic fields and into the beyond of our daily lives. As we reflect in the coming days and all the messages and prayers shared today, may our thoughts, words, and deeds reflect the good work of realigning our own relations with Mother Earth and all forms of life upon her. This sacred circle is now closed. May we go out into the world wrapped in a blanket of love, light, and protection as we breathe new life into creation. All my relations. All my relations. All my relations. Thank and you. Thank again. you so much. Go ahead, Mari. Once again, as we bid you farewell for this evening, we will post links into the chat where you can subscribe to our events list as well as give your support many blessings and thank you so much for inviting us well thank you patricia ann davis for introducing us to mari and bringing we're just i'm just speechless this is perhaps one of the most beautiful thursday nights uh we've gathered for and uh i'm just so thankful uh, if anybody else wants to unmute themselves and say something you're, you're welcome to if that's all right um, and um, just want to remind you that also we have started at the Co-Creators Convergence. We always are here Thursday nights. Everyone is welcome. If you want to get a notice of who we're having each month, you just put your email in the chat. And we've started a new thing that some of you may not know of is that first Saturdays at noon Eastern, we also uh, uh, have started a series uh, in coordination with the Deep Time Network. Uh, that Tex Albert has connected us with. And uh, this Saturday, we will have Annie Spade. And she is also going to be talking about ancient uh, wisdom and remembering who we are. So this is a beautiful thread that we have pulled and we will continue. So you're welcome back and uh, same Zoom link. So uh, you're most welcome. So thank you, everyone for being here tonight. And I don't know if there's any words to be said so much. As this is the year of the tiger, it is the perfect time to reclaim yourself. Thank you. Thank you.